Hello, hello, everybody, and welcome yet again to the Motor One Test Car Happy Hour. Uh, great to be back. I know that you guys were here. Some of you, Jeff, Brett, maybe not you. Jeff, you might have been last week. I haven't been around for a while. I've been on vacation and traveling, so I am uh, happy to be back in the home office working again and, and uh, having another chance to talk about cars this Friday. Um, thanks, everybody, for tuning in early. Thank you, Gino and Jonathan and Kevin uh, for saying hello in the early going. Just as a reminder, you guys, wherever you're watching us, if you're if you're seeing this on Facebook, YouTube, or Twitter, you can leave a comment wherever you are, leave a question, or ask us a question rather about the cars that we're driving, um, and we would love to answer on air. Um, so with that, why don't we start? Let's let's go ahead. Let's 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 go with uh, what I consider to be one of the fun ones first. Brett was in a car very recently that very few of us will ever have a chance to drive, um, and you drove it in in Germany, a something out of Mercedes Museum, right? Kind of, yeah. Mercedes Benz has a, a classic uh, classic center near the museum in Stuttgart, and that's where they maintain um, both customers, private customer cars as well as their own collection of historic cars. So um, we were supposed to, we, were, we were out there looking at some some new Mercedes products as well. And then kind of at the last second, they said, hey, uh, you know, we have these vehicles available for test drives. Would you like to take one out? And, you know, they were they were cool. There were some cool, you know, 90s and 2000s era SLs. And then they said, actually, you know what? We have the 54 300 SL Roadster and the Gullwing. How about that? I was like, Damn it. yeah, hell yeah, <laughs> why not? Let's do it. Oh my god, that smile really says it all for me. I mean, you, Brett, you basically don't have to say anything about the driving experience of the car, but um, one, you look very happy. Two, it looks like if you were even a half inch taller, you might not be able to drive that thing. I was, I was hitting the roof already. Like it was very. I had to kind of like hunch the entire time I was behind the wheel. Um, yeah, and it was obviously very cool, very once in a lifetime kind of like you know, rad, life affirming, all the good things that you want it to be. But it was also terrifying because it was 4 p.m. in near downtown Stuttgart. So it was just like oh, no. traffic everywhere, mer buses merging. Um, the mirror is like way far forward on the fender. So you can't really see. Luckily, it has this beautiful greenhouse with like panoramic visibility. So that was really cool. Um, it was it was a great experience. There's no denying it was. It was pretty what, cool. what does that car cost? Oh, I don't even know the last, uh, Dominic, I am six feet tall. So I was brushing the roof. Anyone taller than me would be, would be pretty cramped. My co-driver there is Andrew Kroc from CNET cars. He fit in it great, but he, he's a little bit shorter than I am. So, but yeah, it was, it was a good time. Um, nice. what, uh, it's, I don't remember how much it's worth. I think it's, uh, by now it's deep in the millions. A couple of years ago, you could get one of these for, uh, one of these for, you know, less than, Less than half a million. I know that like hobby hobby enthusiasts could save their entire lives and buy one for a retirement present. That's not mm -hmm. really a thing anymore. I think this is pretty deep into the one or two million dollar territory. So I would yeah, be I so think... scared to drive that in downtown Stuttgart, <laughs> knowing how much it costs and what it's worth. And uh... well, the, so the kind of crazy thing was, so we started out at the Mercedes Museum and then we drove to the Classic Center, which is in kind of on the outskirts of, of Stuttgart. Um, and I drove the Roadster over from the museum to the Classic Center. And that was like downtown, heavy traffic on the freeway. Like it was truly, it was a very cool experience, but it was truly terrifying. I stalled it once at a green light and I ended up missing the entire light because I couldn't figure out how to restart it. Like Ooh, it was really bad. It was a really <laughs> embarrassing, really terrifying experience, but it was also very cool. Like it was just, you know, yeah. just one of those once in a lifetime things that I feel very lucky that I got to do. Yeah. Well, Jeff, you couldn't you couldn't be too concerned because last time I know this is a couple of weeks ago now, but last time we did one of these, you were talking about driving like a two million dollar Remark, right? Like so. Yeah, uh, that's. A, I mean, I don't know the classics to me. Nuts. Like Brett just said, stalling at a stoplight like that's yeah. so scary to me in the middle of downtown. Like I'd panic uh, with all the people around. But I mean, that's oh amazing. Like I would love, love, love to drive one of those. That the the that convertible to. We're so used to seeing, and 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 the Gullwing is obviously iconic, just like absolutely one of the, you know, mount on the Mount Rushmore of all time sports cars, right? Like no question. 
but the 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 uh, convertible is pretty amazing too, especially in that color with the matching wheels. I, it's just insane. So uh, I've never I've never been anywhere near one of these cars, but I finally have an opportunity. My my father in law who grew up his he's in his eighties and he grew up driving cars in the fifties and you know drove cars from this era a lot. Had he uh, on the East Coast, like had some wealthy friends, never had a lot of money himself, but he has some really fun stories about driving. His friend had a had an SL in Maine, like in Maine and New Hampshire. And some of the, my favorite driving roads out there, he, he's told me the stories of driving that car on bias ply tires, like out through the mountains and on these through these like really crazy uh, twisty uh, mountain roads. And his takeaway was always he. He's not romantic about old cars at all. He's not that kind of boomer where he loves like old Corvettes and stuff. He basically says that they're all garbage. It's like <laughs> <laughs> new cars are so much better uh, that the, you know, especially old American cars, muscle cars, he was like, they were awful. Even then they were awful. Like the terrible brakes, they can't go around a corner, all this. But that car, the SL um, Gullwing was one where he was just like, it felt at the time, literally like decades ahead of everything else that it comp competed with. So um again like i'm sure that wasn't the experience especially like near stuttgart but it's it's um uh got to be really amazing to get in something that's that not only historic but historical right or well, the other and, <laughs> and kind of surprising was uh was it actually wasn't it wasn't terrible in modern traffic uh the steering wasn't power assisted and i don't think the brakes are either they might have a little bit of vacuum boost but besides that it was like Keeping up with traffic was no problem. You know, it has plenty of power and it sounds wonderful. So that was fun. But, um, you know, like it, it felt accurate. It felt tight. It didn't feel like it was rattling itself to bits. Um, you know, probably as, as a result of a tube frame chassis that is still, you know, to this day, like that's very rare to find a car with a tube frame chassis. So could have been just a result of that. But um, it felt it felt great. It, aside from if you could like separate the this car costs more than I will make in 15 years away from it. If you could separate that out, then it was actually a pretty, pretty fun, easy drive, pretty enjoyable drive. So, you know, uh, I, how much was, horsepower does it have, Brett? Do you know offhand? Dang it. Uh, let me just Google real quick. I think it's, <laughs> I don't think it's over. It's, it's maybe like 200, 250 or something like that. It's, mm -hmm. but it's a light car too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Dominic, you're right. Main roads of any era are, are something for sure. And uh, main roads back then, I can only imagine. There's still, it's still a place. And I love this. Like you guys have these out West where it's lots of the roads just aren't open in the winter. They just close them down because they're like, nope, not, it's just not going to happen, you guys. Uh, and then let me just hit to e, uh, EKG Canadian enthusiast. Um, unfortunately, we're not talking about the new RX or the GV80 today. It's an interesting statement that the new RX is better than Genesis GV80. There's a there's a guy on this on this podcast right now who's gonna have a lot to say about that um, next week or maybe in the next two weeks. I can't remember when the embargo is, but stay tuned for more uh, Lexus RX in podcast to come. So, well, if you want to touch on that real quick, embargo actually lifted today. You can read oh, the shoot. first drive review uh, uh, on the Motor One website. <laughs> uh, it just went live this morning, very early. So, um, yeah, hit it up and let me know what you think in the in the comments of that. I think it's pretty great. I don't know if it's better than a GV80, but you know, it was, it's definitely the most fun I've ever had driving a Lexus crossover. So that's, there's something there. <laughs> there you go. Um, all right. On the, on the top, the larger topic of Toyota, then Jeff, let's pivot to the, to our star car, our headliner for this week. Uh, I had my first taste as, of Supra a couple of weeks ago, loved it. The, maybe one of the big things that it didn't have that I really hoped it did was an excellent manual transmission. Um, and you've been in the car that rectifies that, right? Uh, well, it still doesn't have an excellent manual transmission as <laughs> a manual transmission. All right. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. So they finally put a manual in the Supra. And I think someone on Instagram, on our Instagram account, made a comment when I posted a, a picture of it. It was like, oh, the Nissan Z finally made them really do it. And I think that's kind of true. But I think from the beginning, people really wanted a manual on this car um and so you know they went and they put a manual on it they, the really the interesting thing is i mean obviously we all know this is a bmw sourced chassis and it's basically a z4 with a with a hard top right um and so toyota really talked up this transmission beforehand like they they went to the ends of the earth to find the perfect transmission for this car and they you know talked to every engineer they knew and at the end of the day they decided to just pull a zf six speed manual off the shelf, basically the same one you get in the Z4. Uh, and they tweaked it a little bit. The clutch is a little springier. I think the throws are a little bit tighter than what you get on like the, 
the European Z4. Uh, but in general, it, I wasn't like blown away. I'm not, I, I, I'm with Seth that I'm really, like I really love the Supra. It's a car I think I would buy, uh, even though I know it has its own set of issues. Um, but I don't think this really made it better. I just think it made it, uh, it's just another option now you can get alongside the eight speed automatic, which itself isn't that great either. So it's, it, I'm glad it exists, I guess is my point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm like good, bad or otherwise, it feels like it's a car that deserves a manual transmission for, for those people. And, and Jeff, I think it's fair to say too, like amongst even our staff and certainly amongst other car writers, like you're not a guy who's always like, it's manual or death, right? Like, or, or no. Like you're no, kind I'm, of okay with other options. Yeah, I'm very much in the in the camp of like a good automatic is better than a, a bad or to decent manual. Like if uh, the the Hyundai Veloster N is a good example of that, right? You can get the manual in that car and it's fine, uh, or you can get the DCT, which is a genuinely fantastic gearbox and it's the one you should absolutely get over the manual. Like just having a manual doesn't immediately make it better, and I. I think if the Super had a, a slightly better automatic or maybe a DCT, that would be true too. But I think between the manu manual and the automatic, they're both equally, you know, fine. Um, it's just preference, right? And I think in the Super, a lot of people are going to want the manual. Yeah, I, my thing with the car was with the three liter, it felt so um, elemental kind of. Like I remember maybe even talking about here, that I was really surprised by it, the car being not overly buttoned down. And you didn't have to work that hard to, you know, slide the ass around, like drive it, drive it like a, a kind of older, kind of older format, older school rear wheel drive sports car. So I guess in my mind that works really well with the ability to uh, have, or, you know, shift gears for myself or have a little bit more uh, individual gear control than you would with the automatic transmission, despite uh, things like paddle shifters. So um, but totally agree. Like it doesn't always come together that way. My, my example on, on, on that, that tip has always been the, um, the Evo 10, right? Like the, the Evo 10 with the DSG was actually pretty brilliant for the mm -hmm. really brilliant for the era. I think today we might find it a little bit lacking, but at the time that that launched, it was great. And the GSR with the, that had a five speed manual, the five speed manual was really, I mean, you could learn to love it if just because the car was so fantastic, but like, mm -hmm. honestly, like looking at it at all objectively, it was, it was clunky. So um, there are definitely cases where that happens, where, where the auto ish version is more entertaining. Yeah. Or more and, appropriate. Right. Yeah. And they, I mean, other than that, they didn't do anything. I think the visuals are a little bit different. I think uh, this matte white paint is new, which you can see in the pictures. They have a new blue, they have new wheels. Uh, I want to say it's like 20 pounds lighter or something maybe, but all, all in all, it's, it's the same car with a manual, right? And if you like the Supra, then you'll like this. And if you don't like the Supra, then go buy Z. I don't know, but it, I wasn't blown away, I guess is, is my end, end all be all with this car. Let me, I, let me just throw it out real quick to, to, and then let Brett go. But like you guys watching, let us know. Supra, is it a car that you would only buy with a manual? Don't really care prefer the automatic or other let it let us know all right I mean, sorry no worries i'm curious so that that zf6 speed is i, I think bmw has been using it in their like mid-tier you know performance cars for like a decade now i think right. it's probably similar to the one um that came in like the older like v8 m3s and stuff like that um what what would you have changed about it to make it like better more enjoyable, more like more of that elemental driving experience versus just like a Supra with a mediocre manual? Um, I would say the throws are a little bit longer and notchier than I than I kind of like. I don't know if that's just a result of, uh, maybe that was bad planning by Toyota because I drove the GR Corolla right after that. And mm -hmm. uh, the embargo on that is next week, so I can't really say anything, but the back-to-back -back differences were pretty stark. Um, so maybe a little sharper, a little snappier. And I think the Z's transmission is is a little snappier and, and more fun too. So compared to those two, I would still go Z. Um, it's definitely not a bad, like I said, not a bad gearbox. It just doesn't feel special. It doesn't feel interesting. It's just kind of off the shelf BMW transmission. So we've got a couple comments here. Um, I'm going to murder this name, but uh, Art Artigain uh, says hello for Boston. Hello. We're, I was just out the East Coast as well. Um, he's about to take his SS1LE out for a spin. Uh, God love you. Have fun. That's uh, heavy metal, oh, yeah. 
Ho- yeah. Hopefully not in Boston traffic, but uh, hopefully uh, not literally for a spin. Yeah, <laughs> although that's possible. <laughs> um, and then our old pal uh, Jonathan Brown, as I was saying before, Motor One fan for uh, from as long as I can remember. Uh, supers are cool, but at sixty grand, buy a standard Corvette Stingray Z fifty one and run. There's a really strong. I mean, this is this has been the case uh, for as a, forever, right? Like when it comes to Corvette, they're they're performance cars. Uh, and then there's the Corvette. And if you're if you're just after raw speed um, and a lot of other things, too, like I, I love the current Corvette. Uh, it is a absolute may, continues to be an absolute value uh, uh, star right in the in the performance space. So, yeah, I think a lot of I think that's a good cross shop, actually, the C8 and the Supra, even though you can't get the C8 now with with a manual. But a lot of people ask me, like, you know, oh, I, I kind of want to see eight, but the markup is crazy or I can't find any. And I'm like, well, you know, go check out the Super. Now the Z is another good alternative. But it's just it's hard. Fifty two grand for the for the Supra manual, um, I think is reasonable. But then once you get up with the A91 edition and some other options, it does get closer to 60, 65. It gets a little expensive. So. Sure. And I don't know that I don't know how common Corvettes, how commonly Corvettes sell at or near its true base price either. So that's something yeah. to, to bear in mind. And I guess the other thing is, I, and I'll just say it like, again, I, I love the current Corvette. I love C7, too. I really liked all of them that I've ever driven. Owning a Corvette in the U.S. means something different than owning a Supra, for instance, or owning, you know, many a, a Z or a lot of other sports cars. You're sort of you're you're looked at a little bit differently. So, the Supra is way cooler than the Corvette, in my yes. opinion. But agreed. <laughs> I just got curious, and I was doing some googling, and the uh, the uh, the Supra Turbo of like 1995, the one that got discontinued in 95 or 96, the Supra Twin Turbo manual transmission. Is about the same was about the same money when it when it was new as a Corvette um, with the Z fifty one performance package. So they've been the cross shop for twenty years now. It's kind of cool. Yeah. yeah, I think back then the Corvette was definitely more of a uh, a power play and not as much of a sophistication play. Now at least the Corvette's got a little more handling and a little more panache to go with it. Yeah, I guess the counterpoint there is, and I'm not, I'm not really the one to like bash on the BMW Toyota collaboration thing. I think that's just sort of a product of modern manufacturing that we're going to see more of. But back then, a Corvette was really made by Chevy and by GM, and a Supra was really made by Toyota, and you were getting a lot of that, a lot more of that brand DNA in the in the Supra product that you were buying, and presumably the innovation and and build quality and and all the other things that you'd expect from uh kind of 90s era toyota products too so um, well the the z4 and the super aren't made by bmw anyways they're made in austria so sure doesn't, sure the argument's kind of kind of silly but yeah i mean the whole thing eventually yeah. there'll just be one global automaker and it'll make every car <laughs> and every flavor and it'll yeah. probably be called tesla <laughs> right <laughs> um or volkswagen uh <laughs> Right on. Uh, all right. So I guess we can we can move to what I've been driving, something that I, I, I've been characterizing a lot over the last couple of days is surprisingly one of the most fun vehicles that I've been in this year. Uh, that's surprising because it's a giant, what, like 6,000 pound SUV uh, from Lexus. So uh, over the last week, I've gotten the, the new, the 2022 Lexus LX 600 um, that is looks nothing there nothing about this car looks old school other than the infotainment system uh and that's only old school like by a generation but this is a this is a really in my mind old school vibe like in terms of uh the driving dynamics and and kind of the way that it comes across which i which i've really been enjoying so it just almost immediately surprised me when i got behind the wheel and and put some uh the gas down for the first time that this car just like bounds all over the place. I keep I keep saying using the example of like a Labrador puppy for this thing because it's so enthusiastic. Um, the engine is, uh, you know, like actually really we've got like 400, 410 horsepower, close to 500 pound feet of torque. I think it's like 479 or something like that, like more than enough power going to all four wheels. But it's just it just seems really happy, uh, even on like a windy, twisty road. But but primarily, I think I'm getting that impression because I'm I'm 
just unused to cars with this much of a role character at this point, right? Like you turn this thing into a corner, you feel the entire body move on the suspension and it's still under control and it still feels safe and all that, but you really know you're doing something, right? Like if I were to do the same thing in the Supra that Jeff was just talking about, the car would be absolutely friggin' flat, like through everything, it would never move, which is dynamically what you're going for and what you want on a racetrack. But what you want on a racetrack isn't always the most fun thing on a regular road. Am I wrong? Or there's definitely a lot of. Uh, is, does yours have the um, air or the steel springs? I guess it's an F Sport, so it probably has the air, right? It has the air, I believe. Yep, yep. I can look. I have the Monroni right in front of me, but I believe it does. Yes. I mean, yeah. There's a lot to be said for uh, for technically imperfect a technically imperfect driving experience. You know, that's a very like. I drove uh, I drove a um, ultra luxury to Palm Springs a couple of months ago, and it was just like it it had it felt like an old Lincoln, like it kind of just like, like wafted down the road, like it it hit the bumps and it would kind of just like smooth them out gradually, rather than doing that like Germanic like flump, and uh, and it it was great. I loved it. I totally agree that it was a really fun, really entertaining kind of novel at this point driving experience. Yeah, I haven't driven the LX, but I, I have driven the Tundra, which is basically the same platform with a bed, mm -hmm. and it's got the air suspension, and it does feel like kind of bouncy and boundy, but it doesn't, it never feels like out of control or, or like too much. I think it's just really nice and comfortable, and, and it is, it does have a ton of personality, so I would assume, you know, the LX drives basically the same as that. Uh, so, so Gary Clark, first of all, thanks for tuning in. And for the comment, Gary Clark says that grill could swallow a mini Cooper. And of course he's not wrong. Like Lexus has been getting, uh, I would say way more dinged more than praise, like over the last 10 years now for, uh, various iterations of that spindle grill. One of the first, honestly, to go to the super large format, um, really aggressive grill. Uh, I, it still looks um, it still looks aggressive, right? In this case, but do you guys think it still looks weird? Like, haven't we sort of settled in? Haven't we, don't we expect this design language from Lexus at this point? I, I mean, to me, it looks pretty normal, I guess. I do. I think that the new RX actually looks weirder than the spindle. That, I that weird nose that's come down, comes down over the grill just doesn't do it for me on the RX, but this I is okay. Completely. I think that like we, it took maybe one or two years of that, that first gener that first GS really being weird mm -hmm. and i kind of was used to it by then the old the old lx i thought there there was like a mid like a mid mid cycle facelift of the yep. old lx and i thought it was terrible but then when they like did like the final facelift of the lx 570 they kind of settled it in i think yeah overall it's like again like i would never call this an attractive vehicle but i don't think that it's bad looking like it's not a fan i don't think it's that shocking to anybody anymore yeah. what is what is funny to me and this is like like really uh i guess on a personal level but i, I think i've mentioned it to you guys before but my three-year-old has sort of bucketed up all of the automotive world into three different categories right he calls something either mama's car my mom or my mom my, my wife has a a, a 17 uh, audi q5 so just as standard a crossover looking thing as you can get a race car or a Jeep, right? <laughs> and th th that's how he sees the automotive landscape right now, which I actually Me think too. is, he's, he's, yeah, right, he's pretty right <laughs> on. This is, he just keeps calling the race car. And I don't know if it's because of the wheels or because of the grill or no. what, it was before he went in it. And Kyle, maybe you can show like one of the interior photos, it's got like the lurid like red seats and it's really kind of like, it's pretty over the top. Uh, yeah, not not my style, but he didn't see these seats in it. He just saw the outside and he call, started calling it a race car, which I found hilarious. <laughs> I'm I'm genuinely surprised that the LX kind of still exists, to be honest. Like right. I know it has its audience, but they could probably do a unibody, you know, more traditional three row and sell a billion of them. But they keep doing this, which I kind of like, and I I like the LX a lot just visually and. Having driven the previous one, it's got its own, you know, personality. But I always find it super charming that this car is still around. Well, and for what it's worth, it sold better than the uh, than the last Land Cruiser. I think the LX 470 and the LX 570 both outsold the, their respective Land Cruiser equivalents. So, you know, they're they're clearly doing something right by branding it as a luxury car instead of a rough and tumble SUV. They're, they've also, you guys, I, I'm sure that that Toyota is minting money on this thing, right? Because oh, 
obviously like big updates and I'm not saying it's like the same thing, but there the hard points, there's a platform that exists here uh, that, that obviously is used across sort of like Toyota's ecosystem and has been used for a while. And the one that I have is $107,000. Brett, I don't know if I ever saw the sticker on yours. I think Brandon drove one. I saw a review that was like 127 or 130 or something like that. So there's a, there's a lot of cost that's already been um, uh, paid for long, long ago. A lot of tooling that's already been paid for on this car. And they're still selling them. So, well, yeah. what's kind of crazy about it though is the the hard points are like relatively paid for, but these are still hand assembled in Japan, and so the production cost. This has some of the highest production cost of any non ultra luxury automaker. The the Land Cruiser and the LX both. So, I know that the, a lot of the engineering's probably been paid for, but the production costs are huge for this car. So mm -hmm. you know it is still kind of kind of amazing that there's a hand built Japanese luxury vehicle out there when everything else is, is mass produced. But yeah, we got a so comment we, from Naveen ahead, who, yeah. who disagrees pretty severely with our, <laughs> our characterization. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to agree with him on one point that it definitely lacks luxury features. Um, I had the ultra luxury, the most well-equipped vehicle you could possibly get in the Lexus LX lineup. And it didn't have massaging seats up front, which was like at $127,000 seemed like a huge misstep. Yeah, I think that I think that there's, you know, listen, we've been going through a lot like just today we had a meeting about it. We've been thinking a lot about our of the, our star awards, right, where we're going to pick our favorite cars in a lot of classes uh, over the course of the year. And no spoilers on that so far. But um, suffice it to say, like the like cars like like the Lexus LX that we all really love don't always score as well against the truly more modern competition because they don't have some of those that those features, right? I think people are still buying them because there's a ton of equity in the Lexus name. People have been buying now Lexuses for, in some cases, probably for, for you know, four or five, six cars in a row. And so it's it's habit. And they've got the all the Toyota-ness, right? Like they've got an expectation of high level of quality, high resale value, low maintenance, like all that kind of stuff going for them. That said... And I, I sort of mentioned this in the early going, like you get in it, you get in this car and then you get in the equivalent Genesis or Mercedes or something like that from the interior. And you're like, oh, I'm in a totally different world. Mercedes has got a spaceship. Lexus has got like a car, right? So yeah. um, they, they're definitely behind the pace, at least in this product uh, where, where that kind of day to day, the stuff that you're looking at and the tech that your tech interface is concerned. Yeah, um, absolutely. Although I think he kind of lumped in every Lexus in that comment too, which is uh, <laughs> not completely true because the RX is what one of the best-selling luxury crossovers ever. Well, Something and like Brett that. just made the point too. Lexus, yeah, I mean RX sells like crazy. They're selling a lot of the the LXs. Toyota is not going to go broke on these vehicles, despite that the fact that uh, Naveen has got has raised some salient, <laughs> salient points. Um, I think maybe he's, he he might be wrong on the overall business case for it, but so it goes. I we could make this we could make a lot of the similar arguments for for like BMW products too, right? Like yeah. that are a little outlandish and have styling issues, and yet people still want to buy them because they like BMWs and they they tend to keep leasing them right the x2 is a thing that exists still somehow right <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um naveen also brings up the escalade which i i have yet to be in like the the current generation escalade but that would you guys say that's still kind of the class of this class at this oh, point oh yeah yeah absolutely i it, love that it, escalade yeah if you're limiting it to like true full-size body on frame there's no doubt that the escalade's the best you know it's incredible and you can get an Escalade V, which is insanity. It's it's crazy. And it's not even, you know, like, I know it's expensive. Anything in this class of car is expensive, but the Escalade starts at under 100, fully loaded. You know, before you get to the V, it's like 130 or 140. Like, it's it's a lot, but it's not so much more than some of these other cars we're talking about. Yeah. The only, I guess, my only counterpoint to the LX would be that the new Sequoia exists, which is... Mm -hmm basically the same platform, uh, maybe not as nice inside, but close. And then, you know, I think the styling is, is better. So I don't know. It's, it's the full size space is so crowded right now. There are a lot of really good options, but the LX definitely finds a, a niche there. I, yeah, I've always been on, that's a, that's a great point And like an argument that I've made in the past, right. Where Escalade is awesome, but like, you know what? So are Tahoe and Suburban, like in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. like you can do it with Toyota and, and Lexus. And certainly 
um, at a lesser level, I would say I've always loved the Nissan Armada, but I know that it doesn't God. quite play. In I mean, I really, <laughs> I, yeah. maybe it's just I do like really big SUVs too. I think that they're kind of fun, but uh, yeah. But you can make the same argument, right? Like, what are you what are you really getting with the Infinity uh, over the over the Nissan version of it? The the answer is always like something incremental, better better like materials inside, sometimes better technology, but not always. And then maybe the one that affects everybody the most most of the time, like a better sound system, <laughs> like mm -hmm. just just more more speakers. So. You know what they should do? They should just make an LXF and put a big V8 in it and quad <laughs> exhaust tips. That's what they should do. I would love that. Although I'm telling you, like, I was pretty happy with the, it's got the like twin turbo 3.5 liter V6, right? And like I said, mm -hmm. like that thing has no trouble getting out of its way at all, despite being a large, beautiful lady. <laughs> <laughs> all right guys well that's that's a half an hour this is usually where we cut it off um brett jeff thank you so much for uh yet another fun happy hour um i would say we i keep forgetting to kick this off but if i had to pick a winner of the week i'm i'm gonna go with brett with the 300 sl any argument there i agree yeah brett wins <laughs> yet again um california kids always win uh <laughs> thanks everybody for watching us if you uh if you well, if you're watching now, you caught it. But if you want to see some of the old episodes, these are up on YouTube, not live after we publish. Uh, we will be back next week at four o'clock on Friday for yet another happy hour talking about what we've been driving this week. Uh, please join us. Thanks again.